never have I ever, play along with me here, never have I ever told a patient, don't worry, it's gonna be just fine. Guilty as charged. And you've probably had those moments as well. You find yourself all of a sudden faced with a conversation where you're like, oh my God, I don't know what to say. And so the most knee jerk thing that we want to do is to make them feel better and we tend to go to, don't worry, it's not gonna be that bad. That is one of our own traps. And in this video, we're gonna talk about five, five different ways that we tend to get ourselves trapped in conversations, which ends up shutting down the patient and minimizing their feelings, their needs, and their desires. We're gonna talk about that right after this. Welcome back, my name is Tammy, and this is Nurse Minder, and on this channel, we do everything nursing. So if you're new here, consider subscribing below so that you get the next video when it's released. I am super happy to be having you with me on this conversation about how to talk with patients so that we can maintain that therapeutic relationship that we so cherish. Because you know, if we don't have it, then they're not gonna tell us and talk to us, and that's really what we're looking for. We need to be able to serve them in the place where they are and connect meaningfully. So we're gonna talk about five different ways in which we find ourselves feeling trapped and how we may respond in a way that decreases that therapeutic relationship. But I'm also gonna give you an alternative way to approach it. So we're actually gonna talk about a total of 10 different ways of interacting with your patients today. Five bad, five good. You ready to get started? Now, if you've ever had a conversation before in the past where you have said things to your patient, don't worry, it's going to be fine. I'm sure it's going to be nothing. Drop me a comment below. Let me know if this is something you have done. I have certainly done it. Guilty. And you know those moments when they come out of your, your mouth, you're just like, ah, oh, I don't know what else to do. I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. Like, I hope I helped them, but I'm kind of thinking maybe I didn't. They seem to be okay. But truthfully, they're not. So the first one I want to talk about today is probably the most common. It's one we all feel the need to do, and that's to build up somebody's courage or to take away their worry. And we do that by giving them false hope or false reassurance. So false reassurance is where we minimize their worries. We minimize their concerns. We try to make them feel better and boost their courage by saying, you got this. Don't worry. We're with you. You're going to be fine. But that's not always the case. And we actually don't know if they're going to be okay, if they're going to be fine, and if they've got this, right? And so if you find yourself having words like that come out of your mouth, it's okay to pause for a second and go, whoa, you know what, actually, I think I'd like to know a little bit more. And that's where we're going to get to the better side of this. And so I had this patient who came in I was working in emergency and he was probably like in his 30s, 40s at that time and he'd had this unrelenting cough. It just wasn't going away and he finally decided to come in and this cough had been going on for months. And so when I asked him what brought him in today, like why is today the day that you thought you'd come and get some help for this? Because I'm curious as to why six months ago you didn't come in. He shared with me, I don't want it to be cancer. When my dad came into the hospital last time, he didn't come out because he was diagnosed with cancer and I didn't want to come here and find out I have cancer. That's a bomb. And that's often a place where we start to feel uncomfortable because like, ooh, the C word. He's worried about cancer and dying and not leaving the hospital. This is big. So what do I say? It would be really easy to say, don't worry about it. It's probably nothing. It's just a cough. But you know that an unrelenting cough is probably one of the earliest warning signs of throat cancer. So I don't want to say that to him. So instead of giving false reassurance, we go into empathy and we connect with the feeling. Well, it sounds like you're really worried this is going to be cancer. And it must be really hard for you to come in today because it sounds like you've been dealing with this for a very long time. You've been concerned about this for a while and scared to find out. So we want to tap into the feeling to make sure we're understanding them. And that All right, moving on to Number two, the second way in which we feel trapped as a healthcare provider, and that is never have I ever, answer below, never have I ever given advice. If you have started a statement such as, well, I would do, then you've given advice. So I want to know if you've done that. 
drop it below in the comments because I've done that too. And it's it's almost like a set up in a way. I mean, the patient will say, oh my gosh, the doctor thinks I need to have surgery to fix this issue. What would you do? Right? You've probably been asked that question a lot. And our natural tendency is to want to give them advice and insight based on our lived experience. And we say, well, if it was me, I would listen to the doctor or I would get a second opinion or I would talk with my family, whatever that is that you would do, it actually prevents them from discovering what they truly want to do. And so if you've been guilty, I know I have, of giving, I would call that unwanted advice, even if they're asking for it, what they're really asking for is a pathway and some guidance on how to make a decision for themselves. So that's a trap. We want to avoid saying, well, I would do. And instead, we want to shift over and ask some open-ended questions. So if you feel like you've got this trap being presented to you, this discomforting situation where a patient says, what would you do? You're going to shift away from giving advice into asking questions so that we can help them develop their capacity and figure out what they truly want. We want to build their learning. And so then we're going to say, well, what are your pros and cons? Have you talked to anybody? Have you considered? What would it look like if? And so we want to be asking open-ended questions so then they can start to sift through what their concerns are, what their dreams are, what their hopes are, and then they can make the best decision for them. All right, heading into number three. Never have I ever said to a patient, well, it's what the doctor said you need to do, so let's get going. Or, well, that's the doc, they're right, we need to do what he says. Guilty as well. Now, I'll tell you that doesn't actually create a therapeutic relationship, it creates a lot of tension, like I'm the mom, you're the child, do what I say and everything will go well. That's not what we want. And I'm gonna share an example with you of, how, of where I had a patient who was, <laughs> had a path to get home, right? You need to take your medications, you need to do your dressing change, we need to mo mobilize you out of the bed, you can't just lay there all day, and you need to go to physiotherapy. The patient was not doing three out of four of those. She was taking her meds, but she was rather um, hmm, distraught when we'd come to do her dressings, and it was always like, do it later, you're bothering me. Physiotherapy, physiotherapy would come, she would refuse it, uh, and when it came to turning her, absolutely not having any of it, you could roll her and she'd roll right back onto her back, right? So we were concerned about all these potential complications of which she was not. And so one morning I walked in and I said, okay, you've said to me many times how your goal is to go home. So now a therapeutic confrontation is going to identify the behaviors and state the discrepancy that you see. And so her stated goal was to go home. Her behaviors were very much of those that did not want to go home. So there was something up. So in the therapeutic confrontation, I mean, I'll be honest, I dealt with this lady for many days and she was starting to wear on my nerves because we had a path, but she was refusing to get on it and do the things she needed to do to get where she wanted to go. God. So, all right, miss, I don't remember her name. Miss Patient, you tell me that you want to go home. Yes. And you tell me that your reasons are, is that because the food here sucks? She, oh, it's horrible. That you don't get any sleep. Well, how can it? You guys are always in here. And that we're too busy poking and prodding around. And that's why you want to go home. And she goes, yeah, who would want to stay in a place like this? Perfect. Okay. I also want you to go home. Truthfully, desperately, now. However, I also want you to go home. That's my goal. We share the same vision and I'm trying to figure out how to get you there. So I've noticed behaviors that you're not allowing us to turn you, that you're not participating in physiotherapy. And then when it comes to your dressing change, you're always saying later, 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 and that we're having some challenges implementing the very things that will get you home. So what is keeping you from participating? And by giving her that therapeutic confrontation, we learned a great deal about her. In fact, she said, why would I go home? My husband doesn't want me there. Now I will tell you, he was sitting in a chair right beside the bed. He come in every day to sit with her, to read to her, to entertain her. This man was committed to her. All right. So when she said that I was a little shocked, but when I looked at him and his mouth had 
dropped? He was like, of course I want you home. Like, what would, what would make you say that? And then the conversation really was able to go where it needed to go. She felt she had more attention in the hospital with us poking and prodding, coming in to do dressing changes, coming in to roll her, coming in to nag her to do physiotherapy than she had at home. And in her mind, this was a desirable thing, even though she complained about it all day long. So once we were able to identify the real barrier, then she started to participate because now she had this validation from her husband. So a therapeutic confrontation identifies the behavior and calls out the discrepancy to uncover the reason so that we can then, un so we can like knock down that domino, knock down that hurdle so we can move them forward. One of my favorites actually. That's because I love challenging patients. Number four, never have I ever, again, let me know in the comments below, have you ever said to a patient what we call a leading question? So you've been asking them some questions about their situation and you need to know a few more things. You're like, well, you don't smoke, do you? You didn't do that, did you? And so those questions are actually uncovering your opinion and judgment and there's really only one right answer for them and that would be to agree with you and your tone really tells them which side of the fence they need to be on. I've probably done that one less frequently but I still hear it which is why I want to talk about it. And so if you were talking with a patient, you're interviewing them, you're getting um, past history, you know, maybe they were using drugs and you don't agree with it or maybe they were having unprotected sex and you don't agree with it or maybe they're in a relationship that's abusive and you don't agree with it. And you say something like, we didn't go back to him, did you? That only allows them one place to go in order to satisfy you and to keep you happy. So instead, you just want to drop the do ya, okay? And just say, did you go back to him? Do you smoke? Did you have unprotected sex? Just drop, cut it right off, get your opinion and your judgment out because it doesn't belong in that nurse-patient relationship. That's a pretty simple one. Now we're going to go on to number five. <laughs> never have I ever, and I expect a lot of comments on this one because never have I ever asked a patient, why did you do that? Why didn't you do that? Right? Guilty. Why is our favorite question to ask in our culture? And it's actually one that I try so hard to avoid and I teach all of my students to do not ask the why question. There is a place for it, but I will challenge you as well to stop asking why and to put in a when, a who, a what, a how, and a where. Look at other questions because you will get much better information. Now, what happens when you ask a why question? Two things. One is they have to defend their decision, their choice. Two is sometimes they haven't worked it out yet and they actually don't know. I, I don't know why because they haven't had time to think about it. And we're seeing a lot of that right now with COVID in terms that patients are not coming to the hospital when they need to come for care. They have legitimate reasons and they don't come because they're one afraid of getting COVID because what's on the news? The hospitals are full of COVID, people are dying in the hospital, so I don't wanna go there. Two, they're also not coming because they're told to stay home away from people. And three, they don't wanna burden an already overworked hospital system. And so for those reasons, they're not showing up. And then when they do come up and we see that they've like got massive issues that need medical attention, people are saying, well, why didn't you come earlier? So how do we shift out of the why and creating a defensive non-therapeutic relationship? We move into the who, the what, where, when, how. And of course this list can get longer, like can you tell me, share with me, those kind of things that open up conversation. So instead of why didn't you come in sooner, let's ask what's happened since this first started to the moment you've come to see me today? Or what was it about today that made you think this is the day I need to go in to get some help? Or where were you when this started? Just ask open questions to learn more. Forget about your desire to know the why because it doesn't matter. What matters is they're here right now needing your help. So those are our five questions, our five traps to watch for that we sometimes feel that we are put in and five ways to overcome them. Let's recap. Number one, 
Number one, we want to shift from false hope, false reassurance, where we're saying things like, you got this, don't worry, into empathy and acknowledging the feeling that they're having. It sounds like you're really worried about this. Number two, we want to avoid giving unwanted advice. Even if they ask us, what would you do? We don't want to say, if I were you, cut that out. Instead, we're going to shift into, well, what are you thinking in the pros and the cons are for you? Who have you talked to? What else have you considered? All right, so we want to shift it so that they can learn about what they truly want and create a plan for them. Number three, we want to avoid authority-based conversations. Well, this is what the doc said, so let's get up and let's get moving. That is a, that's like parent, child, it's never gonna work, it's gonna create a lot of tension and they're just gonna shut down. So instead we wanna shift into therapeutic confrontation. I've noticed that this is what you've said you've wanted, these are the behaviors I'm seeing and I'm unsure as to why you're moving forward. Let's call it out and ask for clarification. Number four, leading with biased, opinionated, judgment type of statements. Well, you didn't go back to him, did you? There's only one way for that patient to go and that's to say no in order to keep you happy. And if they say yes, they feel worse about themselves. So we wanna shift and we wanna ask just simply, did you go back? Did you smoke? Did you do this? Do you do this? End of remove any judgment, remove any opinion. Okay, get rid of the did ya and the do ya. Number five, the use of why. I highly encourage you to stop using the word why when you're talking with your patients because it creates defense and they have to justify their decision and their position to you. That's never a good feeling. So instead we're gonna shift into who, what, where, when, how, can you share with me, those kind of questions that open up more exploration that gives them a safe place to explore the why without asking it. So I expect those comments below to be blown up with, I have done that, been there, ask the why. Now, I hope this has been helpful for you so that you can start to see what your tendencies are, how you show up when you feel trapped in a moment where you're not sure how to talk, what to say, how to make them feel better. Because I know your heart is good. I know you just want to make them feel safer, calmer, and take away their pain. And you can still do that while being therapeutic. Now listen, don't forget to subscribe. Hit that button below so that you get notified when the next video is released. It helps me build content that I know you want. Comment below with your ideas for future videos as well. If you'd like to support me to continue to do this kind of content for you, you can purchase the NurseMinder merchandise, which is right below these videos. You can get t-shirts, hoodies, sweats, all kinds of stuff fun little socks as well. They make great gifts. Also, you can click on any of the Amazon links and do your Amazon shopping just by, just by accessing Amazon through that link. And then your shopping will be credited to my account in which I get a very, very, very small, very small um, pennies sent my way. But when more people do it, it turns into dollars and that helps me to continue to build this content. Because maybe I, I think I might have missed it. Right? You can always come back and course correct. Course correct. <laughs> Never have I ever. Listen, we're going to talk about five different types of conversations that we have. And never have I ever. Yes, kitty. <laughs> I guess I'm talking too loud for her. <laughs> hey, I know you're probably not ready to get off your phone or go back to work just yet. Or maybe even turn the lights off to go to sleep. So... Why don't you spend a little bit more time here watching another video?